incidentally, you know, they the reason that they wanted me to even try out for the band is they said I looked like I should be in a band. <laughs> made me start playing piano when I was about four or five, and they made me start going to lessons. And, and, the, and I used to cry and, and throw fusses about having, you know, I played purely classical. I was a religious school. Uh, it was a little Trinity Lutheran grade school. And there I was listening to the church music and did a lot of singing. So you might say I have a little gospel behind me. Get a record out, and then from the 12 inch EP, get an album, and then get like a national tour. And do a couple albums, do some music, you know, what every kid wants, I guess. Without a doubt, Roz is the inspirational force behind the five member band. At 15, he quit school, moved to San Francisco, and joined a punk band called Negative Trends. And it got wilder and wilder, and pretty soon. The last couple of gigs, because I, you know, I've been stitched up here, I got another one here, and split my eyebrow from bottles, flying bottles. Um, it just got so bad. The last couple of gigs we played behind chicken wire, and that was for our own protection. His experience in the Bay Area brought a change reflected in the band's lyrics. Our words are, are political, but more in a local sense. I mean, it's for. Our, where other you know people are saying anarchy kill the government, you know the punk bands are saying that. Ours are like songs about dealing with you know everything from uh, your parents' divorce to uh, uh, making the decision to not do drugs. More things that are on a local level that a person can relate to. Theater of Sheep is kind of exactly the opposite of the name is exactly opposite of the music. It's not apathetic. It's not apathetic music. It's involved, it's an activism, it's, you know, I don't know what I would call our music. <laughs> Leslie Arbuthnot and Jim Haskett are the group's composers. I just, for me, it's just original music that, uh, that's that been inputted to me over the, just, all my whole life. Yeah, something that has been, because he writes, you know, he writes the music, he sets down, you know, all the melody and everything. Music's always in my head all the time, every day, and I live for it. And like just today, I was sitting on the steps and I came up with this riff. I said, hmm, I can make a song out of that. shows it to me and I play the same melody on my synthesizer and I enhance what he does and uh, and then I choose to do chords in one synthesizer to kind of thicken up the sound so that and we work with each other. He comes with the whole tape. He's laid down all the tracks. All the rhythm tracks, all the guitar parts, the keyboard tracks, the bass everything. parts, and, and, and then I have everything worked out beforehand where you don't come into a room full of guys that's just going, oh, I don't know what to do here, or, you know, I come in there and I'll tell them.
basically what we're doing now is we're doing like our homework, like if we were in school, we're doing a rough draft of what we want to do for a record. We want to do a record in 16 tracks. Um, Jim is setting up a four track in his basement. Then we'll go in and do like four songs in a 16 track studio. You know, real layered professional sound, something that can go national beyond the Portland market. If you just do a locally produced album with you know, crappy quality for a thousand bucks or something, you can make a record for fifteen hundred dollars. You can sell a couple thousand locally, you make some bucks off it, but you really haven't done anything. You haven't gone anywhere. You're still in Portland, you're a bar band that has sold two thousand your records. <laughs> To give you an idea of the band's budget, Roz recently traded his car for a month's rental on an 8-track tape recorder, and another money-saving move has Roz doubling as manager. Jim rehearses with the band, sometimes I can't even come to rehearsals. You gotta do press releases, then you have to be designing the posters, and uh, you gotta be in constant contact with a lot of the club owners and that kind of thing. You're always getting phone calls, and you're always, you know, it's very little personal time, you know, because most people start calling usually around 7.30, they know that's when they get me, and sometimes it'll just be somebody, some girl wanting to play, <laughs> as I was saying, hello, on March, Friday, or Saturday. Um, I think I can see the calendar from here. March, uh, we play the first weekend in March at the Service Center and La Bomba's, March 4th and 5th. How about maybe, oh God, there's someone on my other line. How about March 18th, maybe? So what happens when the glitter of rock and roll wears thin? If a band's going to remain fresh, I mean, maybe Beatles are the exception or something, uh, I think maybe three albums is the longest a band can stay fresh, and I would not... I don't think our band will last more than a couple of years. I hope not. I would have no problem giving this up, you know. And I'd like to, before I'm 30, or before I'm 26 or 27 even, I think, give it up and write. And I think everybody else in the band has similar goals. You know, nobody wants to be an aging rock star, <laughs> pop star, has been. 